The Secret of the Old Mill, the third book in the series of The Hardy Boys, by Franklin W. Dixon, Chapter 1, A Five-Dollar Bill. The afternoon express from the north steamed into Bayport Station to the usual accompanying uproar of clanging bells from the lunchroom and shouting red caps and bellowing train announcer. Among the jostling, hurrying crowd on the platform were two pleasant-featured youths who scanned the passing coaches expectantly. "'I don't see him,' said Frank Hardy, the older of the pair, as he watched the passengers descending from one of the Pullman coaches. "'Perhaps he stopped at some other town and intends coming in on the local. "'It's only an hour later,' suggests his brother Joe. "'The boys waited. "'They had met the train expectantly to greet their father, Fenton Hardy, "'the nationally famous detective who had been away from home for the past two weeks "'on a murder case in New York City. "'It appeared that they were to be disappointed "'when the last of the Bayport passengers had left the train.' Finden Hardy was not among them. "'We'll come back and meet the local,' said Frank at last. The brothers were about to turn away and retrace their steps down the platform when they saw a tall, well-dressed stranger swing himself down from the steps of the nearest coach. He was a man of about thirty, dark-haired and clean-shaven, and he hastened over towards them. "'I want to pay a fellow out of this five dollars,' "'remarked the stranger as he came up to the boys. "'Can you change the bill for me?' "'At the same time, he produced a five-dollar bill from his pocket "'and held it out inquiringly. "'He was a pleasant-spoken young man, "'and he was evidently in a hurry. "'I could try the lunchroom, I suppose, "'but there's such a crowd, and I'll have trouble waiting,' "'he explained, the bill fluttering in his hands. "'Frank looked at his brother and began feeling in his pockets.' I've got three dollars, Joe. How about you? Joe dug up the loose change in his possession. There was a dollar bill, fifty cent piece, and three quarters. Two dollars and a quarter, he announced. I guess we can make it. He handed over the two dollars to Frank, who added it to the three dollars of his own, and gave the money to the stranger, who gave Frank the five dollar bill in exchange. "'Thanks ever so much,' said the young man. "'You've saved me a lot of trouble. "'My friend is getting off at this station, "'and I want to give him the dollar before he leaves. "'Thanks.' "'Don't mention it,' replied Frank carelessly, "'putting the bill in his pocket. "'We'll get it changed between us.' "'The young man nodded, smiled at them, "'and hastened back to the steps of the coach. "'With a carefree wave of his hand,' I'm glad we were able to help him out, observed Joe. It was just by chance that I had that small change, too. Mother gave me some money to buy some pie plates. Pie plates, exclaimed Frank, with a grin. There's nothing I'd rather see coming into the house than more pie plates. More pie plates means more pie. We might as well go down and get them now, before I forget. There's a shop down the street that we can get the plates and get this five-dollar bill changed. It'll help kill time before the local comes in. The two lads went down the platform, out through the station to the main street of Bayport. Basking in the summer sun, they were healthy, normal American boys of high school age. Frank, being a year older than his brother, was slightly taller, he was slim and dark-haired, while his brother was somewhat stouter of build, with fair, curly hair. As they strolled down the street, they received and returned many greetings, for, for both boys were well-known and popular in Bayport. Before they reached the store, they heard the shriek of a whistle and the clanging of bells that indicated that the express was resuming its westward journey. A friend can travel in peace, remarked Frank. He got his five change anyway. And the other fellow got his dollar. Everybody's happy. They reached the store and paused outside the entrance to examine an assortment of baseball bats, discussing the relative merits and weights of each, and then poked around in a tray of mitts. 
trying them on and agreeing that none equaled the worn and battered mitts they had at home. Finally, they entered the shop, where they were greeted by the proprietor, a chubby and genial man named Mose. Mr. Mose was sitting at the counter reading a newspaper, for business was dull that afternoon. Out he cast the sheet aside when they came in. Looking for clues, he asked humorously as they came in. As the sons of Fenton Hardy and as amateur detectives of some ability in their own right, the boys were frequently the butt of jesting and remarks concerning their hobby. No clues here, continued Mr. Mose. You won't find a single solitary clue in this place. I had a crate of awfully nice bank robber clues in yesterday, but they've all been snapped up. I expect some nice murder clues in tomorrow morning, if you'd care to wait that long, or perhaps you'd like me to order you a few kidnapping clues. Size eight and a half, guaranteed not to wear, tear, or tarnish. Mr. Mose rattled on with an air of great gravity, burst into a roar of laughter at his own jokes, and then swung his feet against the side of the counter. Well, boys, what'll it be, he asked, rubbing his eyes as the two brothers grinned at him. What can I do for you? We want some pie plates, said Joe. Three. Small ones, I suppose, said Mr. Mose, then chuckled hugely at the boys. Look at him in indignation. I should say not, remarked Frank. The biggest ones you've got. Mr. Mose laughed very much at this also, and swung himself down from the counter and went in search of the pie plates. He returned eventually with three that seemed to be of the required size and quality. Wrap em up, said Frank, throwing the five dollar bill on the counter. Mr. Mose wrapped up the, pla the plates and then picked up the bill and went over to the cash register. He rung up the amount of sale and was about to put the money in the till when he suddenly hesitated, then held the bill up to the light. Slowly, he came back to the counter, rubbing the bill between thumb and forefinger, feeling its texture, and minutely examining the surface. Where did you get this bill, boys? He asked seriously. We just changed it from a stranger on the train, remarked Frank. What's the matter with it? Looks bad to me, replied Mr. Mose. Dubiously, I'm afraid I can't take a chance on it. He handled the bill back to Frank and then indicated the package on the counter. What are you going to do about the plates, he said. Have you any other money besides this bill? Not a nickel, said Joe. At least not enough to pay for the plates. But do you really think the bill is no good? I've handled a lot of them and I don't like the look of it. Doesn't look good to me. I tell you what you do. Take it over to the bank, across the street, and ask the cashier what he thinks of it. The boys looked at one another in dismay. It had never occurred to them that there might be anything wrong with the money. Now it dawned on them that there had been something suspicious about the affable stranger's request. Had they really been victimized? We'll do that, agreed Frank. Come on, Joe. Keep those plates for us, Mr. Mose. If the bill is bad, we'll be back with some real money later on. They crossed the street to the bank and went up the cashier's cage. They knew the cashier well, and he smiled at them as Frank pushed the five-dollar bill under the grate. Want it changed? he asked. We want to know if it's good first. The cashier, a sharp-featured elderly man with spectacles, then took a sharp glance at the bill. He pursed his lips as he felt the texture of the paper, and then he flicked the bill across at them again. Sorry, he said. You've been stung, boys. It's counterfeit. Counterfeit, exclaimed Frank. You aren't the first one who has been fooled. There have been a lot of counterfeit money going round the past few days. It's very cleverly done, and it's apt to fool anyone who isn't used to handling a lot of bills. Here, where did you get it? A fellow got off the train and asked us to change it for him. The cashier nodded. By now he's miles away, probably, getting ready to work the same trick at some station. 
I guess you'll have to pocket your loss, boys. It's tough luck. Chapter 2. The Counterfeit Money The Hardy Boys left the bank feeling once foolish and wrathful. Stung, declared Frank, stung by a counterfeit bill. It's the fellows, wait till the fellows hear of this, will never hear the end of it. But a fine pair of greenhorns we must be, stung by a city slicker. I'd like to lay my hands on him for about five seconds. I'll bet he's been laughing to himself ever since about how easily he fooled us. I'll say we were easy. We hadn't a suspicion in the world. After all, Joe remarked, the bill might have fooled anyone. You can't deny that it looked mighty like a real five. They halted on the corner and again examined the money. Only an experienced eye could have detected any difference between the counterfeit bill and the genuine one. It was a crisp and new and appeared in every respect identical with the any bona fide $5 bill that had ever been legitimately issued by the federal government. If we were dishonest, we could palm this off on anyone, just as we had it palmed off on us, said Joe. Oh, well, live and learn. I hate to think of that fellow laughing at us, though. It's a nice price to pay for a lesson not to be too trustful of strangers after this. It cost me more than it cost you, Frank pointed out. It was just my luck that I had three dollars on me, and you had only two. This phase of the matter had not occurred to Joe before, so he felt considerably more cheerful in the thought that he had not, after all, been a chief loser. They went back to the store and dolefully reported to Mr. Mose that he had been right in his surmise about the bill. It was bad, all right, Frank told him. The cashier took one look at it, and that was all he needed. Mr. Mose nodded sympathetically. Well, it's too bad you were stung, he said, but I'd rather it was you than me. In business, we have to be careful. As a matter of fact, I think I would have it would have fooled me, only the bank warned me this morning that there was some counterfeit money going round and that I'd better be on my guard against any new bills. The minute I saw your five was fresh and new, I got suspicious. It's certainly a clever imitation. However, whoever is putting the stuff out is a real artist at this game. We'll be back for the pie plate later, promised Joe. But we didn't want you to think we were trying to pass bad money on to you. Mr. Mose laughed at the idea. The hardy boys passing counterfeit money, he exclaimed. I know you better than that. I'll keep the plates for you, or you can take them now and bring the money back later. Good money, that is, he added, wagging his finger at them. We'll be back, they told him. They went towards the station to wait for the local train on which they expected their father to arrive, and while they waited, sitting on the platform bench, they gloomily discussed the imposition of which they had been victims. It isn't so much losing my three dollars, exclaimed Frank. It's this thought of being fooled by such a simple trick. We should have known that the fellow had plenty of time to get his money changed at the lunch counter or at the cigar stand or even the ticket office. Instead of that, we dug into our pockets like lambs. Lambs don't have pockets, Joe pointed out. All the better for them. They're so innocent, they'd be fleeced of everything they put in them anyway, just like us. We handed over all our money to a total stranger and let him give us a bad bill that we didn't even take the trouble to look at. I wish somebody would have kicked me all round the block. While the Hardy Boys are sitting on the bench, gloomy, awaiting the arrival of their father and preparing to tell him of how they had been fooled by the stranger, it will not be out of place to introduce them still further to the readers of this volume. As related in the first volume of this series, 
The Hardy boys, the Tower Treasure, Frank and Joe Hardy, were the sons of Fenton Hardy, a private detective in international fame. Mr. Hardy, who had been for many years on the New York police force and who had later resigned to carry on a private detective practice, was a criminologist of note. He knew by sight and by reputation most of the notorious criminals of his day, and his master and his mastery over all the branches of his profession was such as to place him in the very forefront of the American detectives. So great had been the demands for his services in solving mysteries of crime that had baffled the detectives force of other cities that he had found it much more lucrative to carry on a practice of his own than to remain attached to the service in any one city, even such a city as the great American metropolis. Fenton Hardy with his wife, Laura Hardy, and their two sons, Frank and Joe, had accordingly moved to Bayport, a city of about 50,000 inhabitants, situated in Barment Bay on the Atlantic Ocean. There, Frank and Joe had gone to school until now. They were in the Bayport High School. Both boys were fully conscious of the fame of their father and were eager to follow in their father's footsteps, although their mother had expressed a desire that they fit themselves for some less hazardous and more conventional profession. However, the Hardy boys had inherited much of their father's ability and deductive talent. Already they had aided in solving two mysteries that had kept Bayport by the ears. As related in the Hardy Boys, the Tower Treasure, they had solved the mystery of the theft of valuable jewels and bonds from the Tower Mansion. After even Fenton Hardy himself had been unable to discover where the, th the thief had hidden the loot. In the second volume of the series, The Hardy Boys, The House on the Cliff, has been told how the Hardy Boys discovered the haunt of a gang of smugglers who were operating in Barmont Bay. In this case, they had received a substantial reward as federal agents had tried in vain to locate the smugglers' base of activities for many months. Following the adventures at the house on the cliff, an uneventful winter and spring had passed. The boys devoted themselves to their studies and an occasional winter holiday. Christmas had come with many presents, and now warm weather was once more at hand. Because of the pride they took in their achievements as amateur detectives, the Hardy Boys felt very keenly of being so easily fooled by the stranger who had passed the counterfeit money upon them. Dad will have the laugh on us now, muttered Joe, as they heard the distant whistling of the approaching train. Well, we'll tell him about it anyway. Who knows but what a big case might arise out of this. The afternoon local pulled into the station, and Fenton Hardy stepped down from the parlor car. Bag in hand, light coat over his arm, he was a tall, dark-haired man of about forty years of age, he had a quick, pleasant smile for his sons, and he shook hands with them warmly. How's mother? he asked. After the first greetings, she's fine, replied Frank. She said there'd be something special for supper tonight, seeing you're back. Good. And what have you two been doing? Keeping out of mischief, I hope. Well, we've kept out of mischief, said Joe, but we haven't kept out of trouble. What's the matter? We just got fooled by a smart stranger who stepped off the express. It cost us five dollars. How did that happen? He asked us to change a five-dollar bill for him. Aha! exclaimed Fenton Hardy, raising his eyebrows. And what then? It was counterfeit. Mr. Hardy looked grave. Have you got it with you? Yes, answered Frank, producing the bill. I don't think... We can be blamed such an awful lot for being fooled. It certainly looks mighty like a good one. Fenton Hardy put down his bag and examined the bill closely for a moment, and then he folded it up and put it in his waistcoat pocket. I'll take care of this. 
If you don't mind, he said, picking up his bag and beginning to walk towards the station exit. As it happens, I know something about this money. What do you mean, Dad? asked Frank quickly. I don't mean that I know anything about this particular five-dollar bill, but I know something about this counterfeit money in general. As a matter of fact, that's why this trip took me longer than I had thought it would. When I finished the case that originally took me away, the government called me in on this counterfeit money case. Is there a lot of it going round? Too much. Within the past few weeks, the East has been flooded with it, and the circulation seems to be spreading. There seems to be a central counterfeit plant somewhere with experts in charge of it, and they are turning out imitation bills so clever that the average person can hardly detect them. The federal authorities are worrying a great deal about it, and this is one of the bills. It looks just like some of the others that have been turned in, although chiefly they have been dealing with tens and twenties. The man who stepped off the train was probably one of their agents trying to convert as much of the counterfeit money into good cash as he could. When he saw that you were only boys, he thought there would be a better chance of getting change for five dollars than ten. Then, of course, he may only have been someone who had been fooled by the counterfeiters and decided to get rid of it, passing it on to someone else. I wish he'd asked us to change one of his counterfeit tens instead, mourned Joe. We would have been five dollars to the good.